big thank you to Ian and the worship team for stepping in uh, with uh, a worship pastor. Tony was gone there in Minnesota for a, a wedding, and so uh, we're thankful for the different gifts that God has given to our church. And one of those gifts are worship team and, and Ian and uh, just the giftings that they have. And we're so thankful for all of you. All of you have great gifts, and we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about four things this morning that I think are extremely vital to each one of your lives and vital to my life, our church, our community. And so I just want to, I want to start out talking about our community. Uh, I want to, I want to talk about Sioux City. Um, talk about some of the, the demographics, some of the, the community, and really talk about the why behind the what. The why for us as a church will always be the people who need Jesus. That's the why. That's why we do what we do. That's why we have Wednesday night ministries. It's the why behind why we gather. Uh, many of us in this room are Christians, and so we gather together and we sing and we, we're encouraged. And some of you came to Sunday school, and uh, the kids are downstairs learning about Jesus, a, a lesson uh, geared towards their age level. And, um, and so we have a lot of ministries that are the what, but the why will always be the people. The why is the, the men and women and children in this community who need Jesus Christ. And it's the, the people of our church. And, and we all need Jesus on a regular basis. But the why will always be people. That's why we exist as a church. We are in the people business. And so if you don't like people, you are not going to like heaven. I'm sorry to tell you. Because heaven's going to be full of amazing people that God has saved and redeemed and taken to heaven um, for all of eternity. I want to talk for a few minutes about Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul. If you have a Bible, you can go to Romans chapter 15. Um, Paul, oftentimes, Paul was a, a missionary. He was a church planter. He went from one location to another location. And, and Paul had a mission and a vision and a group of people he was trying to reach. And, and, and really, as we think about our community, we're the same way. We, we, we kind of want to have a, a, a target group of people that we want to reach. And, and so we'll talk a little bit about that this morning. But I want you to look at Romans chapter 15. Um, here's what it says. Um, Therefore, or excuse me, verse number 18. I will not venture to speak of anything except what, what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of the signs and miracles, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he, he, he's traveling around to different places. And so this is just one isolated location that he's, he's talking about leaving Jerusalem. He, there's other places, Antioch, places that he's sent out. I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. So from, from one place to the next place, he's been proclaiming the gospel of Christ. And so Paul would typically go into a place. He would, he would be sent out from a church, and the church would send him. And so lots of times there are, I think right now, 4% of Assembly of God churches close every single year. So 4% of our churches, which means we're trying to plant, the, the goal of the Assemblies of God is to plant at minimum 5%, uh, 5% of churches uh, brand new each year. So September, there are lots of churches that are launching next week. Next week, kind of a school started, everything's back in order. So next week, there are, there are several churches all across the country, AG churches that are launching. In Iowa, there's about four Assembly of God churches that close every single year. And so if we want to keep up, we need to plant five AG churches every single year. So the world is changing, the church is changing, and so we have to figure out how to do this thing. And Paul is speaking here, and he, Paul had kind of his, his, his vision and what he wanted to do, which was he, he wanted to go to non-Jews, he was called to the Gentiles, he wanted to go to people who were far away from God. There were people who were reaching out to the Jews and and, and that that culture, and he wanted to reach out to people who were far away from God. So he was usually sent out, you know, Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and John Mark. A a small group of people would go out, and then he would go to the synagogue. So he'd go to, you know, kind of like a like this, and he would go, and he would uh, would be allowed to share. He was a Jewish scholar, so he, he knew what he was talking about. They would give him the platform and let him share, and... He would, he would find friends in the church who really cared about the community and then oftentimes they would go with him or they, they would somehow partner with him and in going out into the next step is into the marketplace. So he would go from the synagogue, the church, into the marketplace, go out into the community. 
Um, when I was a chaplain, I used to get some, uh, a magazine, and I think it was called Marketplace Chaplain. And essentially what it was, I had a full-time job outside of the church doing ministry, okay? And so uh, John Millen is the same. John Millen works for a large company here in Sioux City, and uh, he's able to minister every single day. He works a full-time job. He gets paid full-time to minister to people in the marketplace, at a business, at, a, at, at his office, and, and around his office. And he has opportunities to go and help with funerals and help with families in very difficult situations. And so that's ministering outside of the church. And so it isn't just people who get paid full time to do that. God calls all of us to the marketplace. Many of you in this room have jobs or you have opportunities where you can share with people. Maybe it's school. Maybe the school is your marketplace. Maybe college is your marketplace. Maybe, uh, maybe it's your job. Maybe it's a, a group of people that you're around on a regular basis that you get to influence. Maybe your kids' teams or maybe dance or some of those things that you might get to be a part of um, that you can influence. That's the marketplace. He, he would take it from, he wanted to reach people far away from God. He wanted to reach the communities, not just Christians. Our goal as a church, I hope you understand, our goal as a church is not to reach Christians. It's to reach non-Christians. Um, and so if we're, if we're truly a healthy church, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what that may look like. So I want to talk a little bit about Sioux City. I'm by no means a Sioux City scholar. I've only lived in Sioux City for about seven years. But I want to share a few things about Sioux City because it's important to know things about our community or the people that we're trying to reach in order to have a better way of reaching them. And so uh, Sioux City, I'm just going to talk about Sioux City. Obviously we have, you know, Lawton, Moville, Sergeant Bluff, North Sioux City, South Sioux City, Hinton, you know, Merrill, small communities around us. But I want to just talk about Sioux City specifically this morning. Um, Sioux City has between 82 and 83,000 people that live here in town. Um, we are the fourth largest city in all of the state of Iowa. Now, Iowa's not a real huge state. For some states, that would probably be on the really tiny side of things. That's like suburbs in some uh, big cities. Even Des Moines, West Des Moines is one of the up and growing cities. And it's, I think, at 76,000 people. So, so cities are growing around us, but we're a large city. And Paul oftentimes, when churches were planted, they went into large cities. And then they would be able to have a, a regional influence uh, around them. And so, so being a large city really is, is different. Um, I pastored a church before this in a town of... 5,500 people. Uh, my dad's first church was 700 people, or my dad, the town was 700 people. Um, most of my time in ministry or growing up was spent in a town of 1,500 people. Now that's not very big when you compare it to a size of, of our community of almost 83,000 people. Okay? Now our community is uh, 47% male and 53% female. Uh, Some of the demographics, some of the the ethnicities in our community, uh, 71% of Sioux City is white. I don't think that's probably surprising to too many of you. 18% of our community is uh, Hispanic. Um, 3.4 or 3.5% of our community is African American, 3% Asian. Uh, 2.3% of our community is two or more races. And Native American is 1.7% of our community. And then anything under that, 1.5%, uh, uh, there's some smaller groups of people that live in our community. There are lots of different communities. When you live in a larger community, one of the other great things is there's lots of diversity. Lots of different, different people, different experiences, people from different places. And so uh, that, you don't always have that in a small community. So we have a, a diverse community that some communities don't have. Um, 36% of our community over the age of 18, has never been married. Almost one-third of the people in Sioux City above the age... That was a little bit surprising to me. 36% of our community above the age of 18 is not married. Uh, 43% of people are now married. Now, that that number gets a little fuzzy here in just a few moments, and I'll explain why. But um, uh, about 2.5% of our community is separated. About 7% of our community is made up of widows. And about 12% of our community is made up of divorced people. Now, what's interesting about that number is Woodbury County has one of the highest divorce rates in all of the state of Iowa. 
Um, and so that number 12% doesn't really reflect that. And the reason why is because now married people, now married um, people who have been divorced, who have been remarried, that number's in with the now married people. And so that number looks really low, but it's actually uh, significantly higher than that. So that tells a little bit about the people uh, around us, the people that we work with, the people that we may see on a regular basis. Another really surprising number to me was 27% of our community, in Sioux City at least, 27% are 18 and under. And a really big number that surprised me was less than half of that, 13% of our community is 65 and above. Only 13%. That was surprising to me for whatever reason. And then about one-sixth of our community, about 15% of our community lives in poverty. One out of every six people that you see in our, t- our community is living in poverty. Now our poverty compared to what it might look like in, you know, Haiti or another country is, is significantly different. But that's 15% of people. I know uh, at North High School, I think at North High School, 92% of the students there qualify for free or reduced meals. Um, and so that, that, you know, that's just reflective of this school over here. There was a really big number that I really did not like to see, and that number is this. 40% of Sioux City, 41% of Sioux City, is, has no religious affiliation at all. Four out of every ten people that you see in our city has no religious affiliation at all. They don't go to church. They, have no, they don't even care about church. Church is the last thing on their mind. Zero religious affiliation. Then there's a 22% of our community is Catholic and 70, 17% is evangelical. Those are the, the, the really the three biggest religious groups. But non-religious people almost double Catholics. If you... If you if you take all Catholics and all evangelicals, it doesn't even equal the amount of people here who are unchurched or dechurched. 41% of our community. So we have a large mission field here. We love to support missions, and, and that's very close to our heart. And next, uh, and yeah, next month in October, we'll have our missions convention. I'm really excited about that. But uh, we have a local community that needs Jesus Christ. Four out of ten people in our community need Jesus. Then if you throw on top of that, there are people who do affiliate with the church who probably haven't been to that church in years. Oh, do you go to church? Oh, no, no, but my grandma went to a Catholic church, and... Oh, I affiliate with, with Catholic, or my grandma was Pentecostal, and so I'm Pentecostal, even though they maybe haven't been in church for, for years. So, so that's kind of a few things about our community that, that is, uh, hopefully, as we kind of reach our community, because here's what that should mean. That should mean that those people that I just talked about should be represented in, in our, our chairs. 71% white, 18% Hispanic, 3.4% or. 5% black, 3% Asian, um, two or more races, 2.3. We should, have, we, we should have diversity. Being in a, a community of this size, we should have a more diverse group of people. And, um, and I, that's just healthy for the body of Christ to have um, different life experiences, different ethnicities. Because, I don't know if you know this or not, but it isn't just going to be white people in heaven. It's going to be people from every race will be in heaven. And so we want to be representative of our community. That's why it's important to think about these things. Now I want to talk about our church for a few minutes. And I know we've talked a little bit about our history over the last several months. But our church is 107 years old. So when I talk about Paul going into established churches, we're an established church. We are not a church plant. We've been here for a while um, we've been in several different locations. Um, we started out actually in a home. That's how many churches start. We started out in a home and then uh, uh, had a revival speaker come and the church grew and so they had to start meeting in commercial buildings for several years. And then after those years passed, they started uh, the first building, church building, was on Seventh and uh, West 7th Street. And then we went from West 7th Street to 4th and Water Water Street, and then from 4th and Water Street to 14th and Myrtle Street, which is our last location, and we've been in this current location since 1986, so 31 years we've been here at this specific location, and as far as I know, the board hasn't told me we don't have any plans of relocating, so we're here, this is our location, this is where we are, you know, 
uh, some people, uh, oftentimes if I talk to people, they're like, where are you guys located? I'll tell them, and they're like, I don't know where that is, or I've never seen that. I didn't know that was a church back there, and so uh, I always tell people we're located right behind North High School. We have one of our city landmarks right behind us. We're located right behind North High School off of Cheyenne and Outer Drive, and, uh, and so uh, we can, uh, this is where I believe that God places, placed us. It'd be great to be by the bypass. It'd be great to be on a main road. It'd be great to be some of those things. But, but that isn't where God had us to be. He had us to be in this exact location for whatever season and amount of years that he has us here. And so we're here and we're going to do ministry and try to reach out to the best of our abilities uh, while we're here. Now, uh, we've had, I think, if I remember right, I think I'm the 17th pastor at this church. Pastor Al, who preceded me, was here for 22 years, which was the longest of any pastor that had ever been here uh, before. And so uh, I'm going to try to beat that record. Um, We have no plans of going anywhere. We've been here for five years, been the lead for two and a half years, and I still feel like we're just getting started. And so if some some of you are like, you're just getting started? Oh, boy. Um, uh, Anyway, pray for me. Anyway, um, so I want to just read something really quick because back in 1988, the church was, was built in 1986, and then the, the church kind of looked over their history and kind of went through kind of a, an order of pastors and buildings and all those sorts of things. And, and this last paragraph really stuck out to me because it really, really is, is indicative of where we are now. And here's what it says. It says, the vision of impacting Siouxland with the gospel of Jesus Christ still challenges the people of First Assembly to reach out in love with the offering of new life. Our Pentecostal heritage has equipped us to do, to do that not only with our lips, but also with our lives. We believe that we, like our forefathers, everyone who's gone before us here at First Assembly, have been saved to serve God by serving our world as heralds of the good news, and so the tradition goes on. Really what that's saying is this, is we have a specific influence. We're a Pentecostal church which empowers us to do things. Uh, We are a church that believes in following Jesus and helping lead other people to follow Jesus. That's what our mission is. That's what our goal is. We want to follow Jesus well, and we want to help teach and lead other people to do the exact same. So we have a tremendous history as a church that we get to build off of and continue to see God do great things here at our church. That's why we do Wednesday nights and some of those things that we're, we're doing. Um, I want to encourage you, next week, as we're going to start a, a new series. This morning's a little bit different. It's kind of a standalone message. I do a lot of series here at the church. This morning's just kind of a... Just a standalone message. It's not a part of a series. But next week we're starting a new series called Finding Your Way Back to God. And this isn't necessarily for uh, unchurched or de It's for everyone. Whether you've never been to church or whether you've been to church for 40 years, it's a message for all of us. And so we'll talk about that next week. But I want to encourage you, if you've been thinking about inviting a friend to come to church for the last couple weeks or months or years, I want to encourage you, bring them to church with you next Sunday. We're kind of getting back into the, the full fall swing here at church and just want to kind of just gear back up from summertime and uh, looking forward to what God's going to do here this fall. The last area that I want to talk about this morning is our giftings, the gifts. Everyone in this church has gifts and talents. You have gifts that I don't have and I have gifts that I have gifts that you don't have. Every single one of us has different gifts. I want to read a few of these from scripture. If you have a Bible with you, you can look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is just a great chapter alone when it comes to Christian community. But I want to start in verse number 11, and here's what it says. Romans 12, verse 3, excuse me. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Verse 4. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function... Okay? My toes do not have the same function as my eyebrows. Okay? My fingers don't have the same function as my belly button. We understand this. So in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We all belong to one another. It's important. 
We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion with his, to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Those are some of the gifts of the church. Hospitality, help, some of those things. I want to talk about some spiritual gifts. If you want to go over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These are the gifts of the Spirit. And these are gifts that we believe should be in our church. uh, As a Pentecostal believing church. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of gifts. But one but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. These are for everybody. They're not just for a select group. They're not just for Sunday school teachers or church leaders. They're for all of us. Verse number seven. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit or the result of the Spirit working in us is given for the common good. To one there is given given through the Spirit, the message of wisdom, to another, the message of knowledge, um, by means of the same Spirit, to another, faith, by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing, by that one Spirit, to another, miracle, miraculous powers, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between Spirits, to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still, and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one as He determines. God determines who these gifts go to. Now, I want to skip down to verse number 27 and 28 to finish off. He says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each, of, each one of you is part of it. If you're here, and you claim to be a follower of Christ, and you claim to be part of this church, Church, your gifts need to be in action somewhere in this church. Every gift is needed. The Bible doesn't, have, doesn't say, hey, I'm giving you lots of gifts and store them up for yourself and don't be helpful to anybody. Don't do, I don't believe that's the kind of people we want to be. Sometimes we just need to be encouraged. Sometimes we need to see that opportunity for ministry to, to, to step up into that thing. So it's for everybody. We all are a part of it. Verse 28, And in the church God has appointed first, to, first of all the apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then those having gifts of healing, to those who are able to help others with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. And he really just once again, just talking about some of the gifts in the church. Every one of us has gifts. You have gifts. Whether they're the gifts of helps, whether God wants to use you in the gifts of the Spirit, God has gifts in you. And when you do not use your gifts, the rest of the church lacks and becomes unhealthy. If we're going to be a healthy church, which I believe is extremely important, if we're going to reach our target and, and reach people for Jesus Christ, we have got to be a healthy church. And a healthy church is when all of us are working together. When you see the, the gifts being talked about in Scripture, you see them being talked about synonymously with the body working together. My foot is helping the rest of my body right now to stand up. The, my body... Our bodies are designed to, to work together, okay? My brain is telling my hands to do some of these things. My, my mind, uh, our, our body works together. This week I was here at the church and there was a, a, a lady who stopped by the church. She was probably in her mid-60s and she asked me to pray for her. Uh, She lives an hour away and she was getting ready to go to the doctor. And so she asked if I would anoint her with oil and if I would pray for her. And so I said, yes, for $100, I would do that. And just kidding, just kidding. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, And so we came in the sanctuary and I anointed her head. And um, I prayed for her. And uh, I began, uh, we prayed and uh, I talked to her for a little bit. And I I was talking with her and I said, you know, did did you have your pastor pray over you? And she said, well, I don't really have a pastor. And I said, well, I go, well, where do you go to church? I go, you don't go to church? Because she came in and I, she has a big Jesus keychain. So I know Jesus is important to her. And so I was like, you don't have a church that you go to? And she's like, no. She's like, I watch my youth pastor, the gentleman who was my youth pastor, 
as still a pastor. I watch him on TV every single week. I watch him on my computer each and every week. And I said, oh, I said, oh okay, I know who he is, and he's an AG guy here in Iowa and Des Moines. And so we talked for a little bit about that, and, and uh, I said, well, have you tried any of the churches in your community out? And she said, no, because there's no Assembly of God churches in my community. And I said, well, that's okay. I said, you know, find a church that's as close to the Assemblies of God as, as you can. If that's your preference, then find a church that's as close to your, your beliefs and your theology as possible. And, and so we began to talk, and she told me she used to play the piano at her church. And she, we, we talked for a little while, and, and so I just I felt compelled to just talk to her for a few minutes about this. Because I was preaching on it this week anyway about our gifts. And so I said, you know, there may be a local congregation in the community that you live in that's lacking health because your gifts aren't being used there. And I, I wasn't saying it in a, in a condemning or a rude way. I'm just, I was just saying, she has gifts. She loves God. She told me stories of what God has done in her life and benchmarks in her life that, that she can look back on of what God did. And I said, that could be so valuable to another person. That could be so valuable to maybe a young mother who's struggling with motherhood. It could be valuable to a couple who's going through a very difficult situation. It could be valuable to so many people. I said, you have gifts inside of you that, that God gave you for the benefit of other people. And I said, if I were to cut my hand off, um, you know, I need tendons, and ligaments, and bones, and, and skin, all those things that represent my hand. And if I was to, to cut it off, and, and the doctors weren't going to put it on anyone else, and it just... It just was not connected to my body. Um, it would decompose. Um, it wouldn't be healthy. It wouldn't be able to function anymore. And I said, try to, try to reattach it a year from now. It wouldn't, wouldn't work. I said, you know, if, if you continue to live life outside of Christian community, and if you can continue to... to withhold your gifts from the church I said if it, let's say your gift is a hand I said the rest of the church can become unhealthy it just can't be what God designed it to be so we talked for just a few more minutes and she she knew what I was saying she she understood my heart and I hope you understand my heart too um I just believe that you're so valuable to the church. You have gifts and talents that you bring to the church that, that can make this church better and healthier if, if we all just say, I want to be a part of that. And I really do believe that we want to be a part of it. And so whether it's spiritual gifts that, that maybe God wants to use you in the spiritual gifts to give someone a word of wisdom. Maybe it's gifts of administration or gifts of helps. One of the best gifts that I enjoy is the gift of encouragement. Um, some of you might just operate in the gift of encouragement. Guess what? When, when we take Sundays off, what, what happens when there's that person who, who needs that gift of encouragement from you? What's that, that person who needs that? Now, we can believe, you know, we can believe that God's going to send someone else all we want, and we can pray that God will send someone else all we want to, but, but what if God's calling you to do that? And so my prayer and my hope is this, is that because I believe that if you had a gift and someone else could benefit from it, I believe that you would give it. I believe that you would help other people with it. I know many of you would do just that. And so this morning, I'm just going to pray for God to, uh, whether those gifts are dormant, whether we've kind of put them on the shelves and said, you know, I used to be a Sunday school teacher. I used to help in the nursery. I used to help be on the worship team. I used to do those things, and I used to clean the church. And, and now I just don't, I don't do those. Or um, I want to pray that God would activate the gifts inside of you. Because if we're going to be a healthy church, which I believe we all want to be, if we're going to be the healthiest church we can be, it's going to take all of us working together. Just like the Bible says, we're one body. We're not four different bodies trying to work together, being stitched together. We're, we're one body of Christ that God has brought here to our church. And so, so this morning, that's what I'm going to pray for. But this next picture, I don't know if, if we have the last picture, is, is our target um, kind of if you, if, you, if you take our community and you take our church and you take our, our giftings in the middle of that, where those circles all overlap each other, is our target. That, that, that's a place where we see and know our community for what it is, and we see our church and know our church for what it is, and we, we see our gifts and we use our gifts. When, when all three of those things are combined and we're doing those things well, we're a healthier church and we're, we're 
most effectively reaching our community. Loving our community, being a part and plugged into our church, and using the gifts that God has given us. Um, I know some of you may be thinking, well, I don't have any of those gifts that are listed in Scripture. Um, you know, listening is a gift. Listening to someone. Going and mowing someone's lawn for them would be a gift to some, of the, some people. Um, you know, people who are just getting out of surgery or, you know, sometimes just having babies. Sometimes we try to help provide meals and things like that. Those are small little gifts that we can do for one another. But really, our presence in each other's lives is really a gift to one another when we, when we have healthy relationships with one another. And so that's what I'm going to pray for this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to pray for, all, I'm going to pray for our, our community, pray for our church, and pray for uh, our gifts, and, and, and pray that we would be the healthiest and most effective church that we can be. Because if, if we don't want to be healthy and we don't want to reach our community, there's, there's really not a whole lot of point to us to gather and meet on a regular basis. And so I want you to stand with me as we pray this morning. Here's what I want to challenge every one of you to do. Every single person in this room, I believe that it's important for you to pray for our community. If you want to pray for your specific neighborhood, if you want to pray for Morningside or for the West Side or for the North Side or South Sioux or, or North Sioux or, or Lawton or wherever it is that you may be that's part of Siouxland, I want to encourage you to pray for our community every day. Whether it's you put a reminder on your phone, whether it's you, you just remember, you write it down, praying for our community on a regular basis. The second thing, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to commit to praying for our church every single week, every single day. You may not know everybody here. You may not know everybody's names. You may say, hey, I want to pray for that guy who wore the black shirt last Sunday to church. Okay, God knows who you're talking about. Um, pray for one another. Genuinely care for one another. And then to use our gifts. This room this room represents a lot of gifts that God has given. Some God wants to use in the gifts of the Spirit. Some you just have natural giftings that God has given you and equipped you with and empowered you over years to to be a benefit to the church. And and I want to encourage you to use those gifts. And so I'm going to pray that God would, whether those have just been kind of on the shelf or they've been dormant for a while, I'm gonna pray that God would activate those gifts and, and he would give you a new hope to use those gifts. Maybe it's a new ministry or, or a new thing that you're gonna do or jump back into something you used to do, but that those gifts would be active in your life um, on a regular basis. So let's pray together today.